by the end of this decade, more people are going to be, age, well, more global consumers are going to be aged 60 and over. So when you put that in context, this kind of huge focus on millennials and Gen Z, you know, as I said, they're an important group of people, but we need to start paying more attention to older generations. Mm. On today's Tech Talks, our guest is Chase Buckle, the Trends Manager at Global Web Index. And we're talking to Chase because of some very interesting research all about the generational shift on which group of consumers really have the attention of marketeers post-COVID. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly tech podcast with myself, David Savage, where we talk to leaders from across the industry and bring you a bit of tech news. Akish, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Um, how was your weekend? Yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, stayed indoors amongst the, the storm. Uh, don't know what this Which one was called. Did, I was about to say exactly the same thing. I can't, I don't know what, it, Alex, what its name was. Is it, is it Storm Alex? I don't know why Alex is ringing. Uh, uh, anyway, let, let's do, do this, it. Does it start at A at the beginning of each winter and then they do it alphabetically, male, female, male, female, no, all the way through? I, I always thought, I, I, so I think someone fed me a lie when I was young and said that the person who discovers the storm, like on a on a radar, then gets to name it after himself. So for, no, for it's about, alphabetical. Yeah, no, so, so that's when I found <laughs> out, right? So that, <laughs> I, I, I believed this lie for about 12 years. Until I then told someone who then turned around, who obviously knew more than me, turned around and went, no, it's not you, idiot. Um, and, and, Look at this really weird coincidence. Alex yeah. found that one. Beatrice found this one. Yeah. Colin found this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This year it was Adam, <laughs> Bernie and, and Cara. Yeah, basically. I was just like, so then they actually told me and I Googled it and uh, yeah, then found out. So um, Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Before we were saying, before we hit record, um, Kudos to anybody who ran the London Marathon in that storm on their own yeah. with a bib on 26 miles with no crowds, no encouragement, just, yeah. Oh no. And, yeah. No. And if you're in South London, I saw a few of you, South London, where was I on Saturday? Sorry. If you were anywhere around there and you saw a white car horning at you, that was me. So, uh, Do you a bit yeah. of encouragement, a bit of encouragement, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was good. It was good, and and I, and I think some of the other cars then just followed suit. Um, so there was like <laughs> also all we heard was random cars just beeping at these runners, which is um, which is good. Yeah, nice. fair enough nice. to I you. Saw a few. I saw a few, and I was, you know, gave a little bit of a bit of a fist pump as I went past. I yeah. probably just looked like I was mental. <laughs> Hopefully, then probably should have made sense. Yeah, they had a bit on. Yeah, you know. So anyway, um, talking about. Uh, my slight um, genile behaviour. Our podcast is all about the revenge of the boomers today, mm. uh, because we're talking about we're talking about how the boomer, but the baby boomers are now the most important people, basically, in the digital space. Uh, we've got an article, well, maybe not the most the most important, but certainly they're growing in importance. We're going to hear from Chase Buckle. He is the trends manager at Global Web Index. After this interview, myself and Akish will have some commentary and then a quick bit of news. On this morning's show, we are talking to Chase Buckle from Global Web Index. Chase, you're the, the trends manager at Global Web Index. Before we get into anything else, who are Global Web Index? Well, thanks very much for having me on the show. Um, Global Web Index are a market research company, essentially. Well, we provide consumer insight into leading brands, marketing agencies, and media organizations worldwide. And we're home to the world's largest ongoing survey into the digital consumer. So each year we survey almost 700,000 different people across 46 different countries. And the key thing to know about our research is that we, we look at internet users and age 16 to 64, and our research is harmonized. So we can actually look at all of those different 46 different countries and uh, compare them in a like-for-like -like manner, which has proved pretty invaluable during the last uh, six or seven months. Without wanting to make it sound quite basic, I would imagine as trends manager, you were, look at, you were looking at those results and trying to basically find out what the narrative is to, to explain that back to your clients, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse in a way because the, the thing with our research as well is that it's you have about 45,000 different data points in one of our data products. So each time a new data, a wave, wave of data lands, you have this absolutely enormous task of making sense of what's happening 
But at the same time, you're also blessed because, you know, for example, during the pandemic, we were running um, weekly and monthly, uh, later on monthly surveys into what was happening in the ground. And, you know, some of the times I was seeing stuff which just hadn't been seen before. And it was truly, you know, really amazing stuff happening. Um, so, yeah, basically what we do is, I mean, my team, we look at what's happening in the data, uh, make stories of it and kind of tell people what's going on and put it in our reports or infographics and our blogs. Well, look, I think the most obvious thing to ask you there is when you are when you say you were seeing some truly amazing stuff that you hadn't seen before, what are you referring to? <laughs> well, um, I guess like, yeah, that would be one of the main themes um, would be the fact that, you know, this is a global lockdown really that happened, but the the outcomes were highly, di- highly diverse across countries. Mm. Um, so we were asking about things like uh, people's, what they what, uh, whether they approved of their governments, um, whether they approved of businesses, whether they approved of populations, um, and stuff like when they expected the pandemic to be over, how it's going to hit them financially, along with loads of other stuff on top of that. And some of the stuff that really struck me was uh, really quite remarkable was the approval rating stuff. It didn't seem to be correlated with the number of cases relative to other countries. So Japan was the one that actually stood out for me here. The approval of um, the government tanked in Japan, but their cases and deaths were nowhere near that of places like the UK and the US. And we put this down to the mishap of the cruise ship in Japan, uh, which caused a rise in cases, but also the fact that the Olympics were delayed, which has had an effect on their attitudes. But what made this more surprising was the fact that when you interview Japanese respondents, they tend to answer very neutrally. That's because strong expressions of opinions and and they can be seen as rude or taboo in Japanese culture. So their really strong negativity towards their government really did stand out for me. That yeah, I suppose from what we know culturally, that that would kind of make make sense. But your point about the Olympics, I mean, everyone builds up to it, right? And and that's got to have such a knock on effect to society as a whole. I, I can't imagine what the mood would have been like in London if twenty twelve had been delayed for some reason. So. I suppose it's going to cause a a fairly strong reaction even where you don't normally see it. Anyway, uh, look, one of the things that we do want to talk to you about today is is you've got a piece of research out, right, about, again, pertaining to what's going on during the pandemic, but how people are are interacting online and how people are downloading content in particular. And the fact that we're very, very focused on millennials and Gen X, sorry, Gen Z rather, and maybe we shouldn't be. Yeah, um, I think this is something which, for a while, I've looked at the marketing industry and it's been a bit of a bugbear when you do see a lot of people um, looking at like Gen Gen Z and millennials. And there's reason why that happens, you know, like younger generations, they they break the mold, they break the status quo in society, they demand innovation, they reset expectations, all these different things they are really important. But... It's sometimes it feels a bit like tunnel vision when people are looking at these generations. And I feel like you need to give a bit more attention to older generations. Um, and there's a good reason to do that right now, because actually people talk about the, um, the pandemic being a generation defining event. Well, our research shows us that in terms of digital behavior, it's been much more of a generation defining event for Gener X, uh, Generation X and baby boomers, um, so people aged about 56 and over. And it's that's not just the reason, though, because if you look at population trends, like these big mega trends, you're actually going to find that by the end of this decade, more people are going to be, a, well, more global consumers are going to be aged 60 and over. So when you put that in context, this kind of huge focus on millennials and Gen Z, you know, as I said, they're an important group of people but we need to start paying more attention to older generations. Mm. Um, you know, I think I can't remember the last time I, I don't think I've even seen a consumer presentation, which has looked at generation X and baby boomers. There's always been about generations Z and millennials. And like, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of stereotypes and generalizations get thrown out there in okay. marketing when we're talking about these people. It's really interesting actually to say that because I was reading a wholly unrelated article earlier in the week about uh, there's a Japanese woman who I think she's 117 years old and she's become the oldest living person in the world currently. Uh, And she, it's quite funny, she kind of drinks a bottle of Coke and stuff a day. Why is it that really old people always seem to do all the things that you get told not to do? Anyway, um, in, in in the 1980s, I think Japan had 
150 people over the age of 100. And the article said that they've now got 80 odd thousand centennials. Uh, and by 2040, their population would be over 30% over the age of 64 years old, hmm. which just adds to your your comment about the fact that there are going to be a huge amount of people who they might not be, by that point, it might be the, the millennials who are in that bracket, but who are older and consumers of digital tech, right? Hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that this is an opportunity for us as well to think about the fact that we can't rely on generalizations with these uh, uh, generations as well. Like, like, for example, I'm a millennial. Uh, I love avocado and I don't yet own a house, but I do think that there's not really a justification to, as you see in marketing a lot, to to look at these people, you know, say, oh, they, they love experiences. They like, they're all about video. They're all about mobile. And there's definitely like some truth in these things, but we need to dig deeper. And I think that now was a huge opportunity for us to really do that and, and look at these people as, as a very complex and diverse audience as well. Um, so look, what, what, what happened? You know, lock, lockdown comes into effect hmm. and people were worried about a surge in activity. I remember at the beginning of lockdown, people were really worried about, whether or not internet capability was going to cope with everyone online at home all at the same time. Hmm. Well, what you found was uh, when lockdown kicked in, you saw these huge spikes in activity. And then you found that typically the, the spikes did kind of let up. But when you actually split that out between age groups, you actually find that the younger age groups are the ones that really drove the activity at the beginning. They were the ones, that, and, and it really uh, diverted towards a lot of different things, including whether it's social media, video streaming, the stuff kind of you would expect. But also we saw they were doing stuff, more stuff like cooking, um, phone calls, stuff that would be considered maybe more offline and stuff like that. But th as I said, those activity spikes actually settled down fairly quickly to levels similar to that seen before the pandemic, but still slightly higher. But it was only among the older generations that we saw that their activity kept increasing as uh, lockdown went on. And yeah, they, I think we've really come forward a lot in terms of uh, dig, uh, older people's digital behaviors. I mean, I know that my parents, like I think my mum was going on TikTok uh, for a while. Um, you know, I think my 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 partner's grand. She's in her nineties. She's, I mean, just a minute ago, she was just calling her grand on on video calling, and I think it shows you that when it comes to adoption of tech, the main obstacle is just getting people to do things in new ways. Tech is so intuitive now that actually, once we get these older generations accustomed to technology, then it's going to have some pretty seismic shifts in different industries because. You know, going back to that idea I said earlier about like aging, uh, older aging populations, if you think about those populations, they're mainly in places like Europe, North America, and obviously, like you mentioned, Japan as well. Now, if we think about financial technology, um, some social media uh, kind of emerging trends as well, loads of other different stuff in the entertainment sector as well. A lot of the time, when we compare these countries to places like China or or other Asian countries or places like Latin America, we find that the engagement is much lower. And the reason why that is, is partly because online populations in faster growth countries like Latin America and um, Asia Pacific, they skew younger. Younger people are more likely to be online. Mm. Um, but it's also because in older, so in, in, in Western European, especially in North American, uh, populations, there is a higher proportion of older people and older consumers' habits can be difficult to shift. But in the last six or seven months, we've seen some huge strides taken when it comes to adopting technology. And I think that's going to have a bigger impact on different technology, uh, on different trends than many people seem to anticipate. Just to jump in, I mean, you, you were talking about the fact that, that stereotypes between generations aren't helpful. But the one thing that I did notice in some of your research, it talks about the fact that it was a matter of sustenance rather than materialism. I suppose mm. there's that suggestion. And look, I fall into this. Uh, I, I will make random purchases of <laughs> trainers and whatever else and stuff that I probably don't really need and yeah. have bought all sorts of random stuff through lockdown online. But actually, as, as people start to do groceries online, it's that people have realized that the ease of carrying out weekly necessities from the comfort of their safety of their home is that kind of habit that is unlikely to, to then 
go away once the world finds whatever normal it, it's going to kind of follow going forward. Exactly, yeah. That's it, yeah. And you raise a really good point because one of the most remarkable things about the pandemic hasn't really been about sudden, like, you know, huge swathes of fresh users coming online and, and like, shopping online and, and using Netflix. You know, there has been increases in that, don't get me wrong. But the most dramatic and profound change has actually come from people deepening their engagement. So you mentioned online grocery, and that's a really good example because – e-commerce you know everyone's talking about e-commerce right now it's it's a huge winner in the pandemic well our research shows that it's not necessarily been about fresh users uh, fresh online shoppers coming in and we have seen a bit of that but what we found is that more people are buying more products online that they would have otherwise bought offline now that seems pretty obvious but actually it's a pretty profound thing online grocery you know like you said it's not materialism it's sustenance it's people relying on the internet for some of the most basic human needs. And this is something, a huge theme we've seen among older generations. And online grocery is really important as well, because if you think about it, compared to say buying, like you say, a bit of pair of trainers or some electronics off of Amazon, online grocery is a very high frequency category, right? So it means that it's gonna increase people's familiarity with online, increase their confidence, but more broadly, it's going to keep online options front of mind for those people. So that's a really important thing to consider. And I, I suppose the interesting thing from from a narrative point of view for brands is that what you're saying is is not that the younger groups have lost their relevance, but older groups have rediscovered theirs. So, you know, you're, 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 again, your article talks to the fact that when was the last time that you saw a consumer pre- presentation about Gen X and, and boomers, but that is likely to change, right? Well, I hope it does, yeah. But I think it will definitely change. If not in the next couple of years, then definitely after that. Um, you know, I think that what the accelerate, uh, what the pandemic has done, like in many things, has accelerated uh, this trend, uh, which is why we want to, you know, start shouting about it. Also, to be a bit more contrarian as well, um, rather than joining the ranks of people, you know, talking about Generation Z loving X, Y, Z, and Millennials loving avocado and toast, and you know, whatever. Um, I think it's nice to be out there and actually you know, take a corner of something which people aren't talking about and actually show that it is really important. Um, Because as I said, I think the the one thing that really interests me here is the fact that this change in behavior is going to have a much more profound impact on the uh on the trajectory trajectory of different trends than just younger people the younger people were like the trailblazers but now when it comes to actually bringing the market up to um up to speed it's it's older consumers doing that their their behaviors are the ones which are going to suddenly um kick start uh, new trends i think and a, a good example of that is um so we're talking about basic human needs if you think about the internet as a source of security right so um, understanding our own financial health is a great, is a really strong sense of security. And what we've seen is that older people are have, have adopted to like a very quick extent during the pandemic um, internet banking and financial apps. Now that's pretty important because when you think about say uh, bank branches, right? Um, you know, a trend before the pandemic, we saw that many bank branches are closing. Um, internet banking was taking off. But that's been accelerated. And what we found is before it was very much a young person's thing. We did see it among older people, but, you know, younger people were the main ones driving it. But now if older groups who compose the lion's share of consumers and bank account holders in uh, many Western countries, if their preferences start moving towards online, then that kind of trend of um, bank branches closing, you know, bank branches are costly as well, right? So when... um, when the pandemic, when we actually realized the extent of bankruptcies and loan defaults, which are going to hurt the balance sheets of big banks, they're going to look towards their bank branches and be like, do we actually need these? And then they're going to look at consumer behavior, especially among older consumers, who, as I said, take up the lion's share of consumers in Western countries. And it's probably going to accelerate that trend of of digital banking. Do you think there could be a a positive knock-on effect as well in terms of making making sure that tech is more accessible? Because... I mean, if, if I think about the, the the track and trace app that the NHS have launched, uh, I think it doesn't work on a phone that's older than iPhone six. Perhaps you have to have a reasonably new model, and not not everyone of an older generation necessarily has the latest smartphone. They don't. I don't think they change. If you look at maybe this trend is wrong, but I'm not sure. Certainly, looking at friends, parents, and my parents, they change their phones as regularly. So, would there be some emphasis actually on 
building tech that is slightly more accessible with an awareness of that of that digital knowledge gap and maybe helping to close that digital knowledge gap as well definitely yeah i mean i mean just today i saw an article from amazon uh well about amazon sorry they've just released like a care hub thing obviously during the pandemic when it comes to vulnerable older people especially older people who might be living alone people wanted to make sure that they're okay and what you're finding is that lots of different technology companies are trying to serve that need and to serve that need you need to make tech more accessible Actually, I was also looking at um, TikTok. So we mentioned TikTok earlier, and there's a hashtag called over 50. If you look at that, not only do you see loads of older um, people joining in in those TikTok challenges, but you see a lot of different younger people doing very clear how-to videos to get older people on TikTok. So I think there's a there's a huge realization right now that tech isn't just for young people and uh, you know accessibility is something we need to improve. Look, it's fascinating stuff, and, and it obviously it's it's very relevant right now. If someone wants to find out a bit more about some of the research that you're conducting, how would they go about doing that? If you just go uh, to our website, uh, www.globalwebindex.com, and uh, there's a tab there called Resources, you can download any of our reports, any of our infographics. We have huge amounts of blogs as well, and I should I should probably mention as well, all of the research we did over the course of COVID-19, and that was a lot of different studies, that's available for anyone to explore on our platform for free. You just have to sign up. You don't have to pay anything, and you can access some really incredible information. It's very intuitive as well. So I definitely recommend doing that. Cool. Look, Chase, it's been perfect, uh, perfectly lovely, rather, of you to give up some time to talk to us this morning, uh, especially on a Friday. I hope you're looking forward to the weekend. So thank you for that. And uh, I hope I hope that uh, the report does reach many different people and starts to change some opinions. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on the show. Right. So the headline from this basically is by the end of this decade, most global consumers are expected to be older than 60, which I suppose makes sense because people aren't dying. They aren't dying. But we do always think about tech being squarely aimed at you, yeah. me to an extent, yeah. our younger colleagues. Yeah. Um, you know, the next, what's next? What's next? It's always what's next, and what are Gen Z adopting? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, TikTok's a prime example how, how yeah. TikTok has blown up this year. But then this research shows that actually platforms like TikTok are being adopted by older generations. Mm-hmm. And that 2020 has been as impactful for Gen X and boomers as their younger counterparts, because all the younger lot were already on all these platforms where the old lot have all suddenly had to adopt them because they've been told to shield and they've, they've, they've had to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, do you know what? I, I think the biggest thing that's helped is, is the lockdown and the whole kind of working from home, but still staying connected. Whereas I think if you were to, to say the baby boomers and, gen x and whatever i think you know those sorts of people much prefer getting in their cars on the weekend you know going for a little drive going to see a God relative love yeah those. yeah you know these sorts of things um <laughs> whereas I, I think because of because of everything closing down because of things having to be online they've just had to adopt i mean hmm. if i look at my parents i think in the interview they mentioned things like online banking and you know kind of um, applications on mobile phones that sort of stuff we've always been on the go or in in our groups it's always been the cool thing to be on the go right like oh you know i've just got rid of my current account and now i'm on revolut or monto because i can do this on my phone and i can pay on my phone and i can you know do all these funky things whereas for those guys i mean my mum you know she still used to like to go to the bank sometimes to make transactions and draw out money and these sorts of things so i think for those guys they've just had to adopt fairly quickly um, and I think they've done a good job, but I think I do agree with the interview that a lot of consumers or, you know, especially within the marketing realms, they forget about that sort of group where yeah. if you actually think about it, they probably also, I'm going to, I'm just going to say something, it might be a bit rogue here, but they've also probably got a bit more money than, you know, millennials and kind of, you know, Gen Z's to be honest. That, I think yeah. Chase makes the point about, um, you know, Gen X and 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 baby boomers basically being the the significant spend mm. when it comes to groceries. Mm. And now that groceries is online, absolutely. If you're Tesco's, mm. who are you gonna who are you gonna make sure that your online experience is geared towards? Mm. It's gonna mm. be Doris rather mm. than you know me yeah. or you. 
Yeah. Sorry, I've just generalised there. Doris sounds like an old name. I'll go, I'll go with my grandma, Lorna. My grandma was called Lorna, so to me that's quite an old name. Yeah. Um, but, you know, th- those people are going online and spending the vast amount of, of money now. Yeah. And, and so it makes sense that they all of a sudden have much more influence. Yeah, 100%. And, and I think the fact that applications, websites, cons- you know, um, retailers and kind of, you know, retailers or whatever they they need to keep these people in mind because that's that's what's going to help ultimately that could be the differentiator between them having a a fairly stable lockdown covid period or them kind of not going you know the the kind of right way um because if you also think about it people within the millennium thing mentioned kind of avocados and that sort of stuff right a lot of people are on all kinds of weird diets, protein shakes, all this, that sort of thing. Mm. You may not necessarily always need to get milk, eggs, bread, washing up powder, whatever. Do you know what I mean? So I think whereas the, the kind of older lot, um, that's part of the – or if I look at my parents, yeah, that, that's part of their kind of bi-weekly shop is, is these sorts of things. Um, and, yeah, you need, you need organisations and – massive kind of companies to to make sure they're catering to them 100 percent. yeah i find it quite interesting this idea that um you know younger generations will use social media to scroll um and we will endlessly scroll yep. whereas older generations are using it slightly differently so um they're very much relying on it to see and hear friends and family from their smartphones and they are using facebook but other social platforms but they're using them quite differently to the way that we use them and i do find my i find myself scrolling certainly on instagram mm. flicking through flicking through flicking through rather than engaging whereas all the generations are actually using them to bring communities together a little bit more yeah i think um i was having this chat with um with someone on the weekend and he was saying how it used to you used to say a few years ago oh you know i, I got lost in the depths of youtube where you just kind of kept on watching one thing after another, after another, before yep. you know it, you were watching some random documentary on, I don't know, how to descale a fish, whatever. But <laughs> like, but now the same can be said about Instagram because of mm. the adverts, because of the marketing, the hashtags, the, the, the accounts and, you know, the, the ads and all these sorts of things. You're just scrolling, like you said. And then when I compare my Instagram activity – I'm going to compare it to my parents again because they're the, the closest older generation that I know. But, you know, my, my mom hasn't got Instagram, but she's got Facebook. And on Facebook, she's very much, you know, still puts on five, six pictures at once about a family kind of get together and she'll, you know, tag people and make these long, like, captions and all these sorts of things. Then they'll call people on WhatsApp and do these group calls with their siblings who are all hmm. over the world and you know, she's using it very differently to how me and you use WhatsApp. We we yeah. convers- we conversated on WhatsApp over the weekend about some football, and and that was it, right? Um, yeah. But we're we're never going to schedule a WhatsApp call with each other. No. And, you know, <laughs> these no, that'd be very odd. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be a bit weird. Um, but yeah, so but but these guys, you know, that that's what they kind of live on, right? And you know, I will, I will say. I- to, to say, yeah, like on that adapting point, this, this this is a story that always tickles me. It's a good one to say that they need to learn some etiquette. My mother-in-law, bless her, uh, discovered Facebook a, a little while ago and found some some wedding photos of my best mate. I was best man at his wedding, um, university friends. Yeah. Uh, my wife sang at their wedding. So we're on lots of their wedding photos. Mm. They're not married <laughs> My mother-in-law. Oh, no, they are oh. uh, absolutely very happily. But my mother-in-law went through all of Emma's wedding photos and commented, "Haley, her daughter, you look beautiful." Haley, oh, <laughs> every single photo commented. <laughs> like, didn't mention the bride, didn't mention anyone else. Just said how beautiful Haley looked in all of them. She's like, <laughs> my wife was like, "What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you commenting on my friend's wedding photos about how wonderful I look?" She's like, yeah, "Oh, yeah. I thought only you could see those comments." <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? It's, it's, it's innocent. It's innocent. But yeah. it just goes to show how, you know, the little adaptations that they can make is... Will, will A bit of learning on. needed. 100%. 100%. Right. Okay. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, a very quick bit of technology news. 
Now that we're officially in the run into Christmas, why not think about giving a gift with a story behind it? Alive and Kicking are using football as a force for good and helping to support mental health education across Africa. You can do the same by giving someone a football from aliveandkicking.org forward slash shop. Now the footballs come in retro 90s kit designs. So go have a look and give a unique gift that will help make a huge difference to more than just the person who receives it this Christmas. Welcome back to the show. This is an article, uh, predictably from The Guardian, Tech Unicorn Octopus Energy to Create a 1,000 New UK Jobs. Um, so Octopus Energy, um, one of the newest unicorns, became a unicorn just this year after uh, a US um, company invested, uh, sorry, Australian energy company rather, in origin, invested $300 million for a 20% stake. Um They've announced um, a hundred million push into the U.S. market, part of its global, sorry, goal to reach a hundred million energy consumers by 2027, and they are going to hire a thousand employees across places such as here we go, uh, Warwick, Leicester, London, and Brighton um, to try and create a new tech hub in in the U.K. The, or make it the Silicon Valley of energy. And the really interesting thing about this is there are a lot of graduate jobs. So we talk about tech creating jobs that are, that are not necessarily accessible to all. They are hiring from communities and graduates. Uh, so it'll be entry-level roles in technology. So this is good. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Especially when the um, the university students and the, the grads are getting a lot of airtime on the national news at the moment, um, you know, with, with a lot of things and being affected by COVID and a lot of grads being, you know, kind of, having their degrees cut short last year or whatever yeah i think someone like this is, is definitely needed and in, w- where did you mention warwick what did you say warwick uh so it's warwick brighton, brighton um hang on find the part of the article again my eyes are useless here we go <laughs> That's right, warwick sorry. leicester manchester london and brighton yeah well all across fairly, the UK. fairly big spread, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Midlands, South Coast, North. Well, um, no, hang on. You're, you're going to have pissed off some Scots and some Welsh there. All across London. <laughs> all, London? All, all, all across England. England. All across England. There we go. Yeah, sorry. Not the um, UK. Not the UK. All across England. Um, and yeah, I, th- I think it's great. And, and hopefully this is backed by, you know, more government funding potentially or also allowing more organisations to do the same. Yeah. Um, um so yeah. the government are obviously very happy um, yeah. because it's going to help the uk get in line with its pledge to be carbon neutral by 2050 rishi mm-hmm. has come out and said the growth of green jobs is not only good news for british job seekers but a vote of confidence in the uk economy obviously he's going to say that Thank i'm not sure wishing. i can't see anything about investment from the government necessarily no um but it does go on to and i think this is quite interesting greg jackson ceo of octopus said that the technology could help make britain the best place to invest in creating new clean electricity generation he said when apple created the app store no one knew that it would change the way we would order food or transport forever we are revolutionizing the energy industry in the same way creating jobs not just through increased demand for affordable renewables but by facilitating the development for new and emerging electricities like electric vehicles electric heating and vertical farming and that's a good point unless we invest in the infrastructure none of these other things are going to happen yeah 100 percent. and um yeah tough job ahead of them i guess but um to, to kind of build something like that across england um but yeah fair play to uh fair play to greg and um hopefully and we octopus. Uh, and, and octopus yeah and hopefully we start seeing the rewards of that um you know kind yeah. of hard work and stuff so not good news doom and gloom. Yeah, exactly that's what especially if say. it's going to be affordable energy because everyone's energy bills are expected to rocket up because we're all spending far more much more time at home of course yeah and it's gone absolute baltic now um, yeah i think the weather's supposed to improve again really okay i'm hoping I'll, I'll it is let's be honest <laughs> it's shit yeah. um anyway if you did the marathon in the shit weather um well done congratulations yeah. Uh, apart from that, thank you very much uh, to Chase for being our guest. Keish, thanks for joining me. Yeah, and we'll folks. be back at the end of the week. <laughs>